Assalamu alaikum. This is Farah Muzaffar. I'm talking about Parkinson's disease today. So Parkinson's disease is the most common neurodegenerative dis uh, disease. And what it means by neurodegenerative, that it's progressive. It once is established and it is not curable or treatable. It can slow down, but it progresses. So the prevalence which, uh, of Parkinson's disease, which is the cases at present or at any given time. The presence of a disease is any given time. One person of population, an elderly population who are above the age of 65, they are affected. One person of the population. Approximately 1 million people in US or 5 million people in the worldwide are affected by Parkinson's disease. The incidence of this disease, which means the new cases every year. So it's about 60,000 new cases of Parkinson's disease happens every year, everywhere. So the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is mostly clinical. Etiology is not known, not confirmed yet but genetic and environmental factors as mostly talking about. Um, what happens is this disease is, is the loss of dopaminergic neurons. This is in the part of substantia nigra. And we know that substantia nigra is a part of basal ganglia in the brain. Um, there is a loss of dopaminergic neurons and, they, and their production of dopamine is decreased. And the bodies are also found in Parkinson's disease. However, it is not pathognomic of Parkinson's disease. And we will talk more about what are Lewy bodies later. And at, up to the, the, this stage, there is no lab and imaging is required in classic Parkinson's disease, but it is done in some cases to rule out other diagnosis or to differential diagnosis. So as we talked about the environmental causes, um, it is said that herbicides, pesticides, insecticides, and other solvents, they are, uh, if they are used, there is an increased risk of getting Parkinson's disease. Several studies have been shown that also. And one study of meta-analysis of 19, 89 studies showed uh, the use of or the exposure, uh, in fact, to these fungicides, herbicides, pesticides, can increases the risk up to 33 to 80% in the population. Uh, we looked at the caffeine and smoking, the use of caffeine and smoking both reduces the risk of Parkinson's disease. Um, MTPTP as phenyl um, tetrahydropyrene, MPTP, is also a toxin and that developed bradykinesia, um, rigidity tremor, the causes of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Genetic factors are also looked into that. And uh, it is really important on those patients who have Parkinson's disease less than 50 years of age. Parkinson's disease is, um, it's more common in monozygotic twins than in dizygotic twins, who share only about 50% of genes. Early of the um, Parkinson's disease, similar concordance rate for monozygotic and dizygotic pairs. In uh, other uh, studies done in other countries, in, mostly in Europe, they have seen the mutation in uh, Parkinson's disease 1 gene, alpha synuclear gene, um, PRKN gene. Several, uh, several genes have been located that cause mutations in Parkinson's disease, LRRK2 mutation. They have found several diseases uh, that increases the risk of Parkinson's disease. Melanoma and diabetes are important to discuss here. 
um, the treatment of these patients by levodopa or carbidopa combinations that increases, remarkably increases, the risk of melanoma in these patients. Diabetes, in large cohort study researchers have found that uh, people who have diabetes type 2, they are 32% increase in risk of developing later Parkinson's disease than those who do not have diabetes. So these are a few things which are important to mention here. However, in this slide, it is a, uh, several genes, as I mentioned, on your right and on your left. Disease. However, we do not know the exact mechanism what happens when the dopaminergic neurons are dying or when they are dead. It has been postulated that the protein aggregation, mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress that could be a release of free radical, some inflammation and other toxins can lead to the cell death in these neurons and they finally depleted dopamine. Next slide, if we talk about anatomy and physiology of uh, the brain and the function here, so just to, be, just to summarize a little bit, the coronal section of the brain, if we take here uh, and this uh, person and we're looking, or we are looking at the midbrain here in the coronal section of the brain. So in the top picture, we see substantia nigra, which is uh, brown color. And that is normal looking substantia nigra by the naked eye. And uh, the lower picture showed diminished, this is lack of pigmentation that is seen in Parkinson's disease. So just to show this picture, where is basal ganglia located? Where is the midbrain? This is just a revised anatomy, uh, which we have already learned. And just to show the picture, what is the difference between the healthy and the deceased Parkinson's disease, substantia nigra. We are also looking back at anatomy here. So substantia nigra, as we all know, is a part of basal ganglia. Basal ganglia has different nuclei, we call cord, or different parts, and they have different functions. They are all interconnected by the neurons. The main part which we are talking about right now, are we looking at the purple picture, which is a caudate nucleus, it is, uh, which is surrounded, uh, the ends is amygdala. The pink subject, uh, the pink structure is called thalamus and below that, the below one is subthalamic nucleus. This is an important part to remember that the neurons are connected subthalamic nucleus, substantia nigra, right above and below it. Which are we seeing is the globus pallidus part. So all these um, the structures of the basal ganglia are highly connected they are releasing several neurotransmitters here in this area. And the dopamine and acetylcholine are the two most important neurotransmitters that are controlling the um, autonomic function here. So uh, we, in the lower picture, we are looking at the cell body and the axon, the neuron and the nerve ending. And if we look at the dopamine release, it's at the nerve endings. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter, we all know it acts as a transmitter between the nerve endings. So I have made this or chosen this slide to make it very clear and is very simple. On the left, we are looking at the healthier brain and the healthier circuit. And on the right, we are looking at the Parkinson's disease. So what happens? Um, the motor cortex, which is the cerebrum, the brain, uh, blue is the motor cortex. And we are looking here that is, is stimulating our, our uh, excitatory basal ganglia by two A and B pathways. We call A is a direct, that is uh, the excitatory of the reticular formation, direct uh, pathway and the indirect pathway through basal ganglia. But the effect of dopamine stimulates basal ganglia. And at the same time, acetylcholine inhibits, which is in the green, it also affects basal ganglia. And the damping effect on the left we are talking about affects reticular formation. The reticular formation thus, it controls spinal cord, control muscle activities here with the movement and coordination. That is the main part. 
So some excitatory neurons and some inhibitory neurons are acting here. And, the, and, and in the easy uh, language here, when we are looking at the Parkinson's disease, the lack of dopamine yellow, you can see the corrugated lines affecting basal ganglia, and there is no damping effect of reticular formation. We are looking here, the connection is gone, and the reticular form by the excitatory and inhibitory neurons to the spinal cord, it increased muscle tension and tremor. That is the cause of the symptoms that appear in the Parkinson's disease. So when the first symptom of Parkinson's disease appear, more than 80% of the neurons are already dead. So we don't know when actually the neurons start dying and what causes it. Here, it's almost 80% of the neurons are already dead at that time. So what happens to these patients? So we know that the Parkinson's disease has a slow onset. It's a progressive disease. That means more and more neurons are dying and more uh, symptoms are appearing. And there's a disease of basal ganglia. The, the treatment can slow down a little bit, but it does not cure the disease. And it's a progressive disease. It has complications. And it, it, it starts basically asymmetric. The first symptom appear is the tremor. When a, when a patient comes with a tremor and is unilateral, it usually st starts at one hand. This is the most common initial symptom of Parkinson's disease. The tremor, I will talk more about it in my next slide. The symptom of tremor can last in these patients for four to six years before appearing the next symptom of radiokinesia, that is the slowness of the movement, rigidity, which is the resistance to the movement, and gait difficulty. Um, these all symptoms appear later. There are the premotor symptoms have been seen and described in those patients. Some have uh, mentioned that there is a loss of smell sense anosmia, olfactory cell problem. These patients start with the disease long before the, uh, the appearance of a tremor by losing the sense of smell. They, they say that they cannot smell roses or they cannot smell some other stuff. There is a disturbance of REM sleep. We know the REM sleep is an important part of the sleep. So they act out in their dreams, which means some people, they may start by fighting, um, dystonic um, movements in their sleep uh, long before the symptoms appear. Some patients have also complained about have been having constipation long before the symptoms appear. Other clinical presentation of Parkinson's disease is decreased in dexterity, means the tiny movement, there's a decrease in them, lack of arm sewing, mask-like faces, their face are expressionless, they have shuffling when they look at their gait, short steps, shuffling, lack of arm swing are pathognomic of Parkinson's disease. Their soft voice, autonomic dysfunction is common in these patients later. Fatigue, weakness, depression, and sleep problems also come into the picture later. So these are the a few, um, just the picture shown. Usually the onset is gradual after the age of 50, it's slowly progressive. The face like, um, mask like face, blank expression, usually the typical stooped posture. Their tremor is described as pin rolling tremors. They have a finger and thumb usually, and the tremor is at rest. The most important thing we have to notice is the tremor at rest. And uh, of course, um, and sometimes you have also seen the tremor in their tongues, in their lips, in their jaw and head, increases with stress. 
the, the bradykinesia that is the loss of normal arm swing while walking. They decrease blinking of their eyelids. Loss of ability to swallow also comes in these patients. Difficulty initi initiation of the movement. When you ask these patients to walk for them, it will take for them multiple steps, multiple short steps to start their gait or start their walking. Depression comes very early or late. Muscle rigidity is an important part. Increased resistance to passive movement. It, it's, uh, the typical is seen in Parkinson's disease is called cogwheeling, which is jerky and it's slow movement. Rarely occurs, um, it has been described, not many black population have Parkinson's disease. And we already talked about the gait hair. So uh, as I have already discussed, the, uh, the Parkinson's disease, the motor symptoms are the most important that are the vagikinesia, vocal rigidity, postural instability, walking uh, difficulty, tremors, dystonia. These are all on the left-hand side are the motor problems. And these are the very important to treat in the Parkinson's disease and the non-motor skill symptoms, they have mental and behavior issues, their sense loss of sense of smell, sweating, melanoma, and GI issues like urinary incontinence, weight loss, and sexual concerns are all in, in their problems and, and the pain perception. So when, when the patient comes and when you see the patient with having a pin rolling tremor in a classic sign, so we have to uh, see, we have to diagnose Parkinson's disease clinically as, as I already said. So um, it has been found out that two out of three cardinal signs should be there to diagnose Parkinson's disease. So out of uh, the, these three signs, number one, tremor, number two, rigidity, and number three, bradykinesia. So there should be at least two of these should be present in these patients to diagnose Parkinson's disease. The tremor on examination, it should be resting. It can be pin rolling. It can, could not be pin rolling, but that's, it should be at rest. Your hand should be rested. Postural tremor can be treated by hands outstretched and looking at the, and the tremor like this. Essential tremor, usually there is a family history of uh, essential tremor. You can ask the patient if anyone else in the family has um, a tremor. Usually these tremor are um, eight to 12 hertz, means is big. And uh, it has been also seen in patients, if you, if you give a alcohol to these patients, their tremors slows down. So it's a kind of cure, and you can also hear from these patients. And uh, we have to differentiate this resting tremor from the intentional tremor. That is very important. Intentional tremor comes when the patient is doing some work. For example, riding, for example, drinking a cup of water. So the tremor that comes to as an intention to do some chore or to do some work, that is called intentional tremor. So we have to differentiate this tremor from postural, essential, and intention tremor because the Parkinson tremor, it comes under stress and under the resting condition only. And the second thing we see is the rigidity, resistance for the passive movement. We have read in the past in the clinical methods, right? How many types of rigidity we have. Um, we can see in patients, there is a let pipe rigidity, which is slow and and smooth to the passive movements, and there is a cogwheeling which has jerks because of the tremor. These are common in Parkinson's patients. Bradykinesia is the slowness of movement. It's also the reduced span movement, the amplitude of movement. It all comes under bradykinesia. It also comes micrographia, which is a small handwriting in these patients. Hypomenemia is the mass like phase, is already said, is also a part of bradykinesia. Hypophonia, which is the soft tone in the voice, is also due to the bradykinesia. And lack of blinking is also due to this or implicit of the movements. Postural instability is a very important fourth cardinal sign of Parkinson's patient. 
and it usually comes late in the in the disease however if we if the part if the postural instability uh, comes first we have to look at the atypical parkinson's um, disease which we will talk later in differential diagnosis so in a classic parkinson's disease postural instability is there but is not the cardinal sign to diagnose it comes later um, other um, um, other um, things to examine are laryngeal dysfunction we have to check their larynx for their soft voice and and to rule out other problems dysphagia soft monotonous voice vocal tremor variable speech rate difficulty with initiation and stuttering are all due to um, in the examination autonomic dysfunction postural hypotension and gi problems also comes in these patients later um, if if uh, there is atypical parkinsonism if we will not call parkinson's disease if the uh, patients are falling early in the disease if the tremor is symmetric at the onset if they are poor response to liver dopa the disease is progressing uh, very rapid there is no tremor in uh, in the early onset and if there is an autonomic dysfunction in early onset hallucinations and abnormal eye movements at early onset we should think of the other other diseases that is atypical parkinsonism differential diagnosis we have to look at the um the parkinson plus syndrome those who have uh, those diseases i have mentioned here highlighted these are the parkinson plus syndrome we have to look at multiple system atrophy which is a, a disease autonomic uh, problem comes first um, i have already talked about essential tremor progressive supranuclear palsy is an important parkinson uh, syndrome uh, uh, we have to look at uh, in those patients with parkinsonism um, the pathognomic of this disease is uh, restricted eye movements postural instability comes first and uh, neck is tilted to one side cortico basal ganglia uh, degeneration is another one we have to discuss lewy body dementia and parkinson's dementia which is important here Lewy body dementia. The patients usually starts with hallucinations, pa um, Parkinsonian symptoms, extra pyramidal um, hallucinations, vasospatial problem, and dementia in elderly but younger elderly patients. And the Lewy body uh, in their brain is a pathognomic of Lewy body dementia. Parkinson's dementia comes after almost eight to 10 years of having the first motor sign in Parkinson's disease. The first onset of dementia in Parkinson's disease, then we will think about some other diseases. Other um, diseases which we should think about is the Wilson disease, is stroke, normal pressure hydrocephalus, and other dystonias in other differential diagnoses. So what we should do with these patients, as I already said, is a clinical diagnosis in a, clinic, in a classic case, there are no labs or imaging studies are required. So the first thing is to trial of a levodopa carbidopa combination is a golden standard, first line of management in these patients and can also be used as a therapeutic challenge. What it means that in these patients, when you see these clinical symptoms, give them the trial of levodopa. And these patients usually respond, they, they say they are getting better uh, by, by this dose. There's a first sign that we say, yes, this is Parkinson's disease. We, we do an MRI if is required. If the patient is less than 55 years of age, there is no tremor, rapid progression, then to rule out other diseases. PET scan scan is also FDA approved in last year to evaluate dopaminergic neurons. However, like multiple system atrophy and other diseases they also have less dopaminergic neurons as the same picture comes in pet as i already mentioned lewy bodies these are the intracytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusions these are found in uh, parkinson's disease lewy body dementia and they often um, have polymerized alpha synuclein so these are found in some of the patients 
So the treatment uh, is the main goal to, to provide more dopamine in these patients, more availability, Carbidopa, uh, carbidopa and, and levodopa is the gold standard treatment. Other uh, treatments are MAO, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, um, dopamine agonist. In 2010, American Academy of Neurology released guidelines for the treatment of the non-motor symptoms. For example, those of erectile dysfunction, Viagra can be used, polyethyl glycol can be used for the GI symptoms, for um, and other symptoms can be treated by other uh, medications. So how Parkinson's disease medication work here is uh, just by more release of dopamine. And we all know that the nerve endings have a dopamine receptors. Dopamine assist, mimic dopamine production. These are all at the nerve endings uh, that more availability of dopamine in the brain or in the peripheral tissues. Some other treatments I would like to talk about is the deep brain stimulation has been practiced in US. The, uh, if we go back to the anatomy about the subthalamic nucleus, this is the main uh, nuclei in the brain where the deep brain stimulation has been working. Neuroablative lesions, some uh, excitatory and some inhibitory neurons can be destroyed by neuroablative surgery methods. It's helping in some patients. There are some uh, stem cell therapy, gene therapy, neural transportation has been under experimental studies. Management of neuropsychiatric symptoms is important in these patients. Exercise, physical therapy that helps with the balance and the movement uh, disorder in these patients. These patients later need speech therapy, a diet consultation for different uh, long-term management is also important in these patients. Thank you. Uh, uh, there is an email here at the bottom. If you have any questions, you can uh, send me the questions. Uh, this email says f and m o z a f f a at uci.edu. Uh, you can send me an email and ask any questions if you have. Thank you, and it's my honor. Thank you so much.